Brain Power TV with Dr. Echo. Welcome to another episode. And I have the pleasure of having Dr. Funke Brown here with us today. She's amazing. She's a pediatric and adult sleep specialist, and she's going to tell us all about sleep. <laughs> so parents and kids, this is going to be so much fun. So without further ado, Dr. Funke, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Echo. I'm so excited and thank you for the work you do. It's really inspiring. Yes, thank you. You as well. So please tell us how you got to this place in your life where you're empowering parents and kids on, the, on this so basic but so important concept of sleep because this can make or break you and I'm sure you would agree, right? <laughs> yes, yes, that is so true. So, you know, I have... Um, you know, been trained in the medical field from right from, you know, college, I had struggled with sleep deprivation in trying to learn and pull all the all nights and um, burn the candle on both ends and, and realize, for instance, that, you know, I would stay up all night to try to study for a test. And then the only things I probably could remember were maybe things from, from the past, Right. My immediate recall, everything I thought I learned, I was just really having a hard time drawing upon it. Right. And so that was when I really started making those connections between sleep and learning. And some people are just more sensitive to those changes than others. Right. And so I had started prioritizing sleep. I'd started really getting interested in sleep. Um, and then fast forward, went to medical school, right? Went through bouts and bouts of sleep deprivation and being on call. <laughs> been on call for several hours of the day. And by the time I trained the um, American College of, you know, the medical education that really um, imposes um, certain duty hours and things like that was not really a, in making it a mandate that people should work for limited hours. So okay. then we would be on, <laughs> you could be up for 36 hours. 48. You know? <laughs> oh, it was, you know, very, really, and. And, yeah. you know, the mistakes, the errors and things like that would ensue, right? Right. Fortunately, they were able to establish those guidelines and that things have been a little bit better. Uh -huh. um, and then I went in to study pediatrics because I love kids. I love to support parents to advocate for their kids. Okay. Then I did do a fellowship in pediatric pulmonology, which is to help kids breathe better. And that was when, again, the connection. So it wasn't just mood and learning and memory that I was seeing that was impacted by our sleep, I saw that medical conditions as well. So the theme was families would come, he's coughing all night, he's not able to sleep, he's snoring, he's not able to sleep, he's snoring, he's not able to sleep, and his daytime function is not ideal. And so really all that then said made me take a step back and say, okay, you know what, let me study this thing. What's been going on? What's the science behind this? Right. And then that prompted my um, pursuit of a sleep medicine fellowship. And so then here I am. And then I felt like, you know, even outside of what I do in the clinics, I'm still seeing those families when parent, when children are not sleeping well, their parents are sleep deprived. And so I really wanted to make it a mission to educate the parents on how to sleep for themselves, to educate them on how to help their children prioritize sleep right. um, so that we can live better. Yes, amen. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. wonderful. I just, my <laughs> TEDx talk just went live. And I think in at wow. least three or four places, I was talking about sleep and sleep. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I talk a lot about ADHD, but ADHD could also be called the sleep disorder because those mm -hmm. kids are awake at night. Yes, and then their yeah, behavior is like the next day is like yeah. uh what happened well the kid yeah. didn't sleep all night so mm -hmm. I, I too am on a mission to help our colleagues mm -hmm. reprioritize talking about the kids sleep it's not enough yeah. to just say here's some claw needing mm -hmm. let's actually educate these kids and help them mm -hmm. especially with the advent of technologies like yeah oh it's got my god yeah, it's a huge, that's a huge one. And I, and you were so right about that. Like, honestly, sleep deprivation in children manifests as ADHD-like symptoms. That's exactly what it is. Say yeah. it again for them to hear. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so on, what I recommend 
is even when the child is having getting evaluated if their concerns that you know a child is um inattentive or hyperactive or having difficulties with focus i would say make sure they get evaluated for their sleep because mm -hmm. that may be driving a lot of those symptoms right they can't they i mean of course children with ADHD have sleep problems and then right. sleep issues can contribute to worsening ADHD symptoms. So what came first? But I would say sleep is free um, in that sense. If you can learn how to prioritize it, let's start with that as we work on all these other factors. Okay, wonderful. So <laughs> you're going to tell us all about it. So tell us. So this mommy comes and sees you and says, I have a three month old, I have a four year old and I have a six year old. So tell me how <laughs> am I supposed to get this done? I know. You gonna tell them. <laughs> yes. So I think the first thing I am so big about is, you know, in addition to caring for the child, you know, making sure that we take the history and all that right. is really finding out the health of the mom too the mental health of the mom. Yeah. You know, I've had parents who say they're so sleep deprived they said they don't even know how they drove to get to the office. Yep. So, I mean, that's dangerous mm -hmm. because if they're drowsy driving, it's similar to drunk driving. Actually, there's some studies right. that say it's, it's worse than drunk driving. Right. So the first thing is to assess safety, make sure that, you know, the mom is safe. She's, there's no risk that she's in, that's going to be imposed on her or the children and things like right. that. And, you know, to start with, I think, if the children are not sleeping, really, that's that's the first step. Okay, something is wrong. The likelihood that the children are not sleeping at all is close to zero because sleep is a biological need. It's a necessity. So no matter what, they are probably getting some sleep. Mm -hmm. They may not be getting adequate number of hours of sleep. Right. They may be getting um, poor quality sleep. Right. Or their sleep may be um, fragmented. Mm -hmm. And so there's so many reasons why that is happening. Right. So the first thing usually is really getting a sense of what's going on around the home, what's going on around their sleep. How are they being put to bed? Mm -hmm. Because one of the things we know is the way we fall asleep is really what's needed to be able to maintain sleep. Right. So it turns out we all wake up in the middle of the night every single person wakes up we go through different cycles of sleep right. we go through light sleep deep sleep and what you call REM sleep and then we have a very brief awakening called an arousal it's so subtle that most times we're not even aware of it um and the reason why we're able to cycle through like that is because there's there's the things in place when we fell asleep that's still in place so one of the things i say is imagine if you have your favorite pillow right Right. You sleep with that pillow or for a child, a lovey or something like that. Right. Or you have a blanket over you when you fell asleep. And sometime in the middle of the night, that blanket falls. You're going to wake up, right? And what would you do? <laughs> Look for it. <laughs> exactly. Because all of a sudden you're more awake. You're like, something is missing. I feel cold. Right. The way I fell asleep is absent. So you'll pick that up. Right. So That's we're going to look at that with kids. If they're right. falling asleep and the last time they remember was they were being rocked to sleep. If the last time they were they remember was there was a bottle in their mouth and they fell asleep. Right. When they wake up like they always do about five times at night is normal. And that bottle is not there. That parent is not there. That rocking motion is not there. Then your brain wakes up more. Of course. And so then you're seeking out that response right or you're seeking out that association right. to be able to fall back asleep and so that's what the sleep associations then or the crotches and the things like that come in right. that's a very common reason why kids have a hard time in the sleep and those sleep crotches kind of present differently at different ages so in very small children say about four months or so it's the rocking it's the bottle or so Right. For the older ones, it may be that they just like a parent to lay by them or be with them when they're falling asleep. And then for some, it's the bottle. So really identifying what do they need to fall asleep. The goal is to try to get them to fall asleep independently so that when they fall asleep independently, the last time they remembered, I was there on my own. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so when they wake up, they're able to say, okay, all right, right. I guess I'm just going to go back to sleep. So, and I think one of the things I also want to encourage moms is every child can learn this. 
they can learn it no matter how even children that are developing differently children with neurodevelopmental conditions they can still learn how to sleep well um so that's just one and i'm happy to you know go into other causes why people can have a hard time sleeping but that's a common one i hear (laughs) okay sure so no but i really before you continue i really really like that point you made Mm. that the way they fell asleep is what they're gonna wake up and look for so parents it may take you a month but mm-hmm. it's better for you to walk at that thing that small mm-hmm. thing consistently which is yeah. getting them to sleep without anything mm-hmm. and not keep giving in it's hard mm-hmm. we're not advocating yeah. that you leave your kid to cry forever no yeah. but yes don't give up because it does it does it does happen if you keep yeah. up with it yeah if you just stick with it and and, and it's um you know usually depending on the age for most kids I mean a lot of the studies that have been done even if you decide to sleep train your child and you want to do like the cry it out method or just the kind of the gradual method there's been no studies to show that they have any long-term neurological psychological um um sequelae because during the day you're present during the day they feel they know they feel secure they feel safe so right. this is something, it's not like you abandon them during the day and then at night it's like, oh, you're on your own. No, they already know your mommy is going to be back in the morning, right? right? So I think that's something you always have to do. As long as they're healthy, as long as they're not in pain, as right. long as they don't have other conditions so that are, that's going to make them wake up, which right. then sort of takes me into the broad categories of why um, some children may have a hard time. So the first category is sort of more of those, um, you know, those either behavioral things or conditions that children need. They want to, another cup of water. They want someone to rock them. You know, that's the first category, sort of behavioral. Right. The second is medical problems. So there may be medical conditions that um, children need for them to be able to stay asleep. So uh, um, I'm sorry, medical conditions that may be affecting their sleep. So right. if they have sleep apnea, which is common in children, mm-hmm. very common, especially between that age of two years old and about seven or eight years old is a really common age. Although you can see it in all extremes, you can see sleep apnea in, in newborns, you can see it in teenagers. Right. And essentially what that is, is um, um, upper airway obstruction, meaning your upper airway is collapsing during sleep. And so some children may okay. snore. Nope. And what happens is then it makes their brain wake up a lot. And so that's a condition that has a lot of long-term effects. So that's if you do have your child that's snoring persistently, has a lot of daytime um, sleepiness or other daytime problems, it's important to speak with your your pediatrician um, so that they can have that evaluated. Yes, for sure. And then the third would be things that are present in the child during the day um, that's also present at night right so if you have a child who's very anxious if you have a child who's who has ADHD that doesn't go away (laughs) it doesn't go away it just has its own manifestation if you have a child who's very testy and already limit setting during the day they may decide to test those limits again as night so Right. Um, we see that throughout. So again, treating and focusing on what those conditions are and making sure you try to optimize and support them the best they can, can also help improve their sleep. So when the parent, that, those, that parent shows up with those three kids, I'm thinking of things in those buckets to then decide on, okay, where do we need to tackle? What do we need to address? What conditions need medical um, treatment, what conditions need some, you know, some limit setting, some parent training, some behavior adjustment, what right. conditions are just sleep hygiene, because it turns out kids love soda, they're drinking caffeine, you know, those things can also affect your sleep. Yes, yes, Woo, that was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. That was really good. I like the way you broke it down into different areas. So, so what do you say to teenagers? I know you've mentioned that you have a course for teenagers. So yeah. teenagers are notorious yeah. for not sleeping well. So yeah. what, what tips do you give teenagers? How do you approach the teenagers? Yeah, so, you know, I, it turns out that uh, that's just a, been a passion of mine. One, because this, 
teenagers are going through a very rapid period of brain development, right. emotional, their physical, their, their physiology is changing, their bodies are changing, their brains are changing, emotions are changing, peer mm-hmm. pressure, their school, there's so many things that are coming at them at the same time. Right. And so a lot of those things kind of set them up for challenges with their sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, the first I would say is just their physiology. So with puberty, right, there's a shift in their circadian rhythm. And so then what happens is that they have a delay. Our brains produce this, some hormone called melatonin, which then helps us to sleep. For, for teenagers, they have a kind of shift in that internal clock. We all have that internal clock that regulates when we fall asleep and when we wake up. And so they're shifted. So physiologically, if you have your your little, your child, your eight-year-old that would fall asleep at 8.30 p.m. or something or 8 p.m., all of a sudden at 10 p.m. is like, what? They're 13 and they're like, are you kidding? I don't feel sleepy. It's 10 p.m. <laughs> no, I still don't feel sleepy. Right. So they have that shift. So it's not something they're forcing on themselves. It's just right. what their bodies are prone to. Right. That would be fine because usually when they fall asleep, they should be able to stay asleep and sleep the entire night and get their recommended eight to 10 hours of sleep. Right. The problem is society does not support that right? Because on the back end, they have to get up at 6 a.m. or 6.30 for school with the early school start time. Right. And, you know, we all have what you call our circadian nadir, which is really when we're most sleep, when our deepest sleep during the course of the night. And so for us as adults, usually that's around, say, 3 or 4 a.m. or so thereabout. For teenagers, because they have that shift, it's yeah. around 4, 5, 6 a.m. Right. So when we're asking them to wake up so early in the morning, some kids are waking up as early as 6 or 5.30 in order to catch the bus or whatever for school. Right. It's at a point where their brain, the, the stage of sleep they're in is what they need for memory, what they need for learning, and so what they need for their mood. So they're being shortchanged on that end. And remember, they've gone to bed very late. So right. they're now chronically sleep deprived. And to make up for it, they try to sleep in on the weekends, but you, you just can't make up on, on so can't. much sleep deprivation, right? right. And right. so then that's, and because they're in such deep stage of sleep, the parents are like, well, he sleeps through four alarms. We almost have to pour water on him to wake up in the morning. And it's like this back and forth. And then there's, you know, the parents feeling the child is lazy. The child is exhausted. So they're moody. Right. They're testy. They engage in more risk-taking behaviors, which are all yeah. consequences of sleep deprivation. Yeah. So sometimes really focusing on trying to advocate for them to, you know, get to bed at a reasonable time. And really, if you can partner with your school district to really work on getting the schools, um, the middle and high schools to start later, that's one thing we can do. I mean, that's a societal change. And a lot of organizations, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, so many organizations have already said, you know what, we recommend that middle school, high school start later because that's more in line with our teenagers' physiology and their needs. And so that's one big change and that will take time. In the meantime, as a parent, some of the things you can do is engage in conversations with them. I mean, it's, it's, it seems frustrating, but help them understand the connection. Right. For example, between when they sleep well and they just wake up and they're like a whole different child and the days they don't sleep well, sometimes they just need to make that connection. Yes, and, that's so and important. Another thing, yeah. <clears throat> another thing is a lot of times because they're exhausted, what are they doing? They're reaching out for caffeine. Mm -hmm. the energy drinks, the soda, they're just trying to get through the day. Now they've drunk soda and caffeine and and, and other caffeine containing products until dinner time because they need to get through their homework and they need to get through all the extracurricular activity and they need to prepare for the um, AP classes the next day. (laughs) And then their minds- I really feel tired listening to this. (laughs) (laughs) And then their minds are racing because, oh my gosh, I didn't finish and all that. And so it's hard for their minds to wind down as well. So all those things. So some behavioral factors also contribute. 
some of the anxiety with just the pressure the society places on them is playing a role. And then there's the one you talked about, we talked about at the start of the day, technology, right? That's now undermining all of those things whereby you know they're so connected. Um, social media, you know, text, group chats, all those things. There are two ways by which that impacts their sleep. One is because um, the blue light from the devices, right, from the screens, right? (laughs) What that does is it makes, remember we talked about that melatonin. Melatonin is released by our brains in response to darkness. It actually starts to be released during the dusk. So when things start to get dark at night, But the light from your phones, the light from the video games, from the computers, it's a blue wavelength light that then makes the brain think, oh, it's still daylight. (laughs) I'm starting to wake up. So then they're not able to. So then, you know, remember, they already shifted. So that even causes more of a shift. And so that's one reason, because sometimes my teens will say, oh, but I have the amber light glasses or I have the blue light um, um, filtering um, function on my phone. The other piece is just that, you know how you feel when you get a text just before you go to bed, you're like, oh, should I respond now? What am I supposed to say? Or you just feel aggravated or the notification. So a lot of that even also contributes to sleep disruption in them. And I think that was part of that. Those those were things I was sitting with, with these teens. I'm like, how are we going to help these kids? How are we going to help them sleep better? How are we going to empower parents? And how can we reduce the arguments they're having with sleep more, don't, I don't need sleep, yes, you do, it doesn't matter, I don't care. How do we decrease that tension? I wanted to go straight to the teens themselves. And that's what prompted me to create a sleep in teens course, um, mainly for the teens. I mean, of course, the the parent has to oversee that and all, but this is really bringing the education, bringing the, um, the understanding to their level so that they're empowered to make the right decisions. And so um, that's definitely something I've been so excited to share with the world. Oh my gosh, everybody <laughs> should get in on this course. <laughs> no, seriously, because just the way you broke it down about the connection between when they the when you said that their brains are at the 4 a.m. time, when close to when they're waking up is really when their brains are that's when their brains are starting to do its functions that they need. And it's like, uh uh-oh, what are we doing to our kids? Yeah, yeah, it's a a problem. Um, Some schools, quite a number of schools actually have already implemented the late, um, the delayed school start time for teens. You know, it's a a big deal, right? Because that means you're gonna have to flip. There's gonna need, need to be funding for more buses. You know, there's gonna be, and then you think about like after school activities. So there's a lot that's going to be involved. So it's a big undertaking. But mm-hmm. studies that already looked at communities and school districts that have been able to get this in place, I've seen a significant change in academics, oh, in the course. degree of sleepiness that the teens are having, right. in, in their mood, mm-hmm. in the rate of, um, you know, car accidents, because that's also one big one as well because teenagers driving sleepy when they're just learning to drive it's just not a good combination so it's a it's a big undertaking but there are things also even before that while you continue to advocate that you can work on on an individual level yeah I was just thinking I have a 13 year old and and our school starts at seven (laughs) like I need to come (laughs) up with a plan here how to get this kid in bed (laughs) I mean they go to bed at 8 30 but yeah it's going into eight I mean ninth uh, sorry yeah. eighth grade and and mm-hmm. the amount of work is increasing so it's yeah. like getting that homework done earlier yeah. so she's going to bed hopefully on time yeah okay yeah I have, to, I have some work to do too <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh well yeah. oh, this was so good let's listen to you so so please tell our listeners where we can find us definitely about your your course for teens and and all the amazing education you provide yeah absolutely so um the best one of the places you could find me is on social media I'm at restful sleep md and there i provide quite a bit of just information because knowledge is power yes and then i think that's where we start because that's our first step towards transformation so i do that 
I also have a YouTube video that's um, Dr. Funke Brown. Okay. Um, and then my website is a great place to just like, it pulls it all together and that's restfulsleepmd.com. Okay. And then um, right there, restfulsleepmd.com slash courses will take you to my courses page. There you'll find the Sleep in Teens course. And, you know, it's a self-paced course so they can move as fast as they want or take their time. I recommend, you know, doing the course, um, maybe it's like seven modules with a workbook. So they'll be able to do some reflecting, which is something that it's a skill that we all need to teach our children, not just to right. learn to learn, but to learn to make change. So right. there's, a, there's, a, there's a workbook attached, right. as well as a sleep diary. Um, and the sleep diary just helps give more objective information on how they're doing with their sleep and right. how that changes over time. Right. So that would be, those are places you could definitely find me. Okay, and she did not mention this one. Let me show you. Yeah. This. You see the shirt? She makes them and it says, God is within her, she will not fall. Now, yes, I saw it on her website and I was like, I have to have one of those. So tell us about Art Naya in... Uh, really and brilliant. <laughs> yes, yes. So Art Naya was a person that was birthed from a place of, a place of, pain for me um it was around when I lost my mom and so I really wanted to channel creativity and I'm someone who's an encourager of people of women yes. and so I started this design um and also radiate brilliance is a is a sort of another work that I do which is to really empower women I, honestly to radiate their inner brilliance we have that light that we can shine and so yeah. I'm able to give expression through that um through you know products and things like that and I thank you so much this is such a lovely surprise <laughs> you're welcome so where can we find Art Naya tell us <laughs> yes so if you actually go to my um restful sleep md um website radiate brilliance is off kind of a spin-off from that website. So you'll get to Radiate Brilliance and then you see a whole world of inspirational products and blogs and things like that. So yeah, um, yeah that's so fabulous. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so, so wonderful. Yes, please go get yourself some teas. They're so nice. <laughs> and yes, I, I looked at her blogs. Very, very inspirational. So mommies daddies i hope you learned as much as i did from this and you know like she said have conversations especially with the teenagers and work things out with them instead of you 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 which i'll be guilty i've done so <laughs> um so yes uh, thank you so much dr funke for coming on here Thank you so much for having me. This has been very, 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 this has been so much fun. <laughs> yes, yes. And so to our friends, I wish you a wonderful week ahead and see you on the next episode. Thank you.